there could be two very classic scenarios. One uh, could be of uh, Nero playing the fiddle while Rome burnt, and one could be music, prose, poetry, leading societies and countries through emancipatory radical revolution. And there can be many things in between. And uh, an idea, uh, a recent backdrop could be perhaps uh, the uh, sci-fi carnival in Uttar Pradesh, where the political honchos were gyrating with Bollywood film stars while the riot victims of Muzaffar Nagar were freezing to death or the recently concluded ehsas e kashmir the Zubin Mehta concert in Kashmir which promised to be this uh, <coughs> vow to the Kashmiri people uh, promised to promote peace and integrity <coughs> in the region but it turned out to be this extremely exclusive event which turned Srinagar into an inside-out prison. And in fact, four youth, Kashmiri youths, were shot down in Shopian when um, Zubin Mehta and the uh, Bavarian State Orchestra were playing uh, with Beethoven and Tchaikovsky. And on the other end, we do have, uh, we had a, a parallel event called Hakikat e Kashmir where the local people, uh, the local youths of Kashmir, they got together and they so evocatively expressed stories of their oppression through drama, music, art, theatre. And in fact, perhaps in a more effective way than the usual trope of hartals and boycotts. So this, uh, to navigate this landscape, this extremely complex and complicated landscape of the role of culture and ideology, in societies, especially societies as fraught and as violent as we are living in. I have with me two very, very interesting voices. Uh, both of them have had a multiplicity of historical and cultural experience to know and understand the extreme potency of uh, literature juxtaposed in uh, simmering political backgrounds, its extreme ability to change, to steer courses, to change the direction of winds. So, Sham Salvadurai, I'm sure a lot of you must be aware of his work. And now he's a Sri Lankan Canadian novelist who was born of a Sinhalese mother and a Tamilian father. And their family had to emigrate to Canada because of the ethnic riots in this country. And uh, so, a lot of his work reflects the extreme amount of violence of his childhood and his adolescence. And then, uh, uh, she. There's Sadaf Saas Siddiqui, who lives in Bangladesh, and uh, she works to promote, uh, <coughs> she's a writer and an entrepreneur, and she works to uh, promote South Asian arts and culture in, Tha in Bangladesh, and she's also the co-producer of the Hay Festival in Dhaka. And in fact, uh, even Sham uh, was uh, curating the Hall Literary Festival for two years. So, to start with both, uh, you know, I'd like to ask the same question to both of you. Know, what essentially do you think is the role of uh, culture in societies? Well, um, let me just start by saying that I'm, I'm a writer, so I'm not a sort of a cultural pundit, and I would speak uh, as a novelist rather than as a cultural pundit. And I'm also not going to speak in general terms, I'm going to speak about Sri Lanka specifically. Uh, because that is really all I know uh, or care to know about. So what role does uh, culture play in Sri Lanka right now in a, what we call a post-war but not a post-conflict situation? Um, well, I think that one of the, I mean, again, there's a multiple, there's a multi multiple, there's multiple things that, a, that culture can do in a situation like Sri Lanka. Um, on a simple level, it can provide pleasure and distraction from a very uh, fraught situation. So we must always remember that culture does do that. It provides uh, escapism, it provides pleasure, and I, so I believe that pleasure is a very important thing in human life, and particular, particularly for those people who are living in a war, a torn situation. Um, I think that in the current situation in Sri Lanka, what it can do, I I feel very important thing it can do is it can help the two sides um, learn about each other by looking at all the graves that have existed uh, in the last 30 years. I think each of the communities in Sri Lanka have their single story of what happened in Sri Lanka in which they are the sole victims 
and what fiction and poetry and, 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 non, and creative nonfiction can do is it can provide the brain, the multiple ways in which human, human beings interact with each other across these boundaries and, 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 and meet each other at, at these so-called boundaries. And um, so for myself, I can only say that um, I thought I've thought about this a lot and um, during the creation of the Gaul Festival. And uh, what I've done is I have a project in Sri Lanka called Right to Reconcile, it's W-R-I-T-E, to, re to Reconcile, uh, in which I brought, I bring, I, you know, I do a call for applications and I brought together 24, uh, I chose 24 participants from the various communities and we meet together in a workshop situation which allows them to know each other, first of all. And uh, I teach them the skills of creative writing, which I think is, I want to give them something as well uh, that, I, that, that I can give. And they've written work that, I've, uh, that we've published now in an anthology, and all the work um, reflects this grain. So I, I think it can play, uh, you know, I think the culture um, has a role to play in Sri Lanka right now. Um, I can go on, but I think um, question yeah, I mean, I, I, I will also think, speak um, not only as a writer, but just somebody who is working, living in Bangladesh, it's been my home uh, for many years now. I grew up in England, but um, I got involved and, and started to know more about my country and um, I started having a deep respect for the resilience and warmth, you know, of people. And, um, and I think at this stage, um, you know, if we reflect on, um, basically the questioning debate that culture can bring, questioning the self, um, expression, uh, and you know, if you look back in the history of Bengal from the seventh century, um, I think these deep ingrained cultural practices that we've had uh, from our Buddhist past, Hindu, uh, Hindu past, and Christianity, and of course Islam, and the Islam has been a very uh, kind of mystical-based Sufi exploration um, kind of Islam. Um, as opposed to, okay, I think a kind of quite regressive, dogmatic, and literalist Islam that is, is uh, threatening so many, uh, I think, the Muslim majority countries. But if we look back on our history, these ingrained cultural practices, um, which sort of started in, in the seventh century, the Tantric Buddhist practices that we've had, um, to today's expression of Baal music, which is a mixture of Sufism and Tantric practices as well. Um, it's, it's, it's given us, I think, the power to, or empowered us to question, to debate, to uh, help us decide our own belief systems. Um, and I think this is extremely important at least in this day of kind of binary, is it with us or against us? Um, and, and this is what actually, in, in the last Hay Festival, we tried to bring in, because where there is this, you know, you're either pro-liberation or you're, you know, um, pro-Islamic. And the fact of the matter is we are, we are there are all these gray areas Understand that this was time now to be confident about who we are as a people. 
and we need to get like this into the world. We need other voices because there's so many of them. The 5,000, more than 5,000 words are on 1971, but in Baghdad, Qazi Nazrul Islam are great poets. You know, five percent of his work is being translated. Um, there are new writers writing in English now, whereas they didn't have any access to the outside world. So we felt that you know that we've got so much rich dialogue going on amongst ourselves at different levels, but um, you know, the outside world is more, but we also are becoming a bit insular as well. So, you know, this this kind of debate is, is, the, is the debate that needs to be going on, actually. Uh, you know, taking from that point, you know, but who are, what's the true character of these literature festivals? You know, one of the critics of the Paul Literary Festival, you know, and he said, I'm just quoting from there, that, you know, um, that uh, who are these people who are attending the Gaul Literary Festival? It is mostly the chick lit crowd who go to literary festivals to imbibe in the ambience and not for the lack of books, to put it mildly. Okay, I, I know the, uh, the journalists are there. It, it is kind of a misogynist thing to say anyway, the idea you know, of chick lit and sort of, yeah, there is a sort of dismissal of, of women right away in, the, in that term which I find misogynist and the guy is misogynist. Um, I, um, <laughs> I, um, I, I don't think that the festival does that. I think I think he was, I think he's wrong about that. I think the festival certainly doesn't do that. I think it it, it did certainly on the night when you're uh, engaging some serious discussion and people really do care about literature and they do uh, they came because they care about literature and I think also you know we have so many stereotypes about other people. I always find it fascinating because you know. We assume that, uh, let's be honest, we assume that elite women are stupid and that they don't read and that what they read is trash. But it's not true. And this guy is attacking these women in particular who make up the majority of the audience. You know, and I, I just I just find that, you know, so we are, we are going at each other on these various levels, which I find interesting. And there's always this discussion, uh, this kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of hidden assumption that because you're, well, you're, you know, you're not intellectual, you can't be. It's sort of a, a reverse of saying because you're poor, you are in that situation. Um, with the Gaul Festival, there was a lot of sort of hardcore political discussion. We did have uh, panels on reconciliation, on um, various subjects like that. I was the first person to introduce uh, Hamlet and some of his literature into, into, the, into the festival, which I thought was important as a program for, for university students but he brought them in free and, uh, you know, just gave them a pass to see whatever they wanted to see. And, you know, I mean, um, I mean that, that, I mean, that's, what, that's what you can do in a festival. You can actually bring in people who don't have, a, uh, have access to it. And one of my favorite stories is this. I know that some of the, uh, one of the professors told me that, uh, you know, he sort of, they, they sort of bunked together. The idea was to put the single and Tamil students together, in, 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 you know, together. And one of his, the Tamil boy, uh, told the, his professor, he said he was watching this single guy because he read at night. He had never imagined that one read for pleasure. And he said to me, you know, that, that guy, he just reads for pleasure. He's not reading for an exam or anything. And I'm going to buy a book and I'm going to read for pleasure too. So, you know, when you hear something like that, it makes you realize that there, there's a way in which you can sort of queer the the eliteness of a literary festival by bringing in other people and other voices um, and by providing, of course, a bunch of people. Just as you said, you know, what else? But and my question is, what else can you do with the literature festival? So what exactly is the point of a democratic uh, platform? You know, how does one take the dialogue forward from here? What happens then? What else could we do? Well, you know, um, you know, literature, the reading of literature is, is a private act. And I think that um, in, a, in, a, in a repressive society, the very privacy of reading um, is subversive um, on some level. And, I, and so I think that in an audience like this audience, for example, people are going to take from it different things. I mean, I, I mean I've sat in an audience and listened to somebody speak, and what I take away from it stays with me. As for the dialogue going on, I don't really think that it physically goes on as in, you know, we're not, uh, the people in the audience are not going to go up and form study groups and, and, and read, you know, whatever uh, work. 
But well, yeah. Uh, so what, what, what I, I meant was reform. the idea of cultural reform. You know, why are we pursuing these cultural? The idea of cultural reform in a society. Could this be a challenge? And so that if you'd like to put your uh, views on this. Um, I, I don't know if it goes so far as to say a, a literary festival to about cultural reform, but I think that as, as far as Haydaka is concerned, um, I think most people in, who are involved with or have come to it or in Dhaka, it, it's kind of what about a, a, a somewhat of a renaissance to literature, interest in literature that have been transformed. Uh, people, I think, have been inspired to write, um, especially those writing in English feel that you know, there's, there's a space for them now, a platform, um, and we're encouraged all sorts of different you know, types of literature, right, right down as I said, say, from maybe a vowel rendition, or um, uh, you know, uh, some, we, we actually had a cross-dresser from, from the village who uh, is, is performing something which they used to perform all night at the village, but nobody is, is paying them money anymore to do that, so we gave them slight space. Um, uh, you know, so we've, we've had all sorts of, we've, we've had, you know, um, English imprints, publishers are deciding that, oh, you know, that there, there is a readership now, everybody's not just watching, you know, Star TV and Hindi and soap operas or whatever. Um, so I think that there has been a sort of renaissance um, in Bangladesh anyway, at a certain level. I mean, cultural reform, I mean, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that term, I mean, it's such a it's a broad term in the Sri Lankan context. I think it's it's simply trying to um, you know in a very repressive situation, frighteningly repressive actually in terms of freedom of expression, uh, trying to on some level you know provide as much of a space as possible for uh, the for the ventilation of, of, of diverse thought. I mean. Beyond that in Sri Lanka right now, it's difficult to think beyond that. It's difficult sometimes to think beyond uh, the well, level of I think, of I, think I, agree. I agree because um, even if we're not looking at the wider concept, um, we, we did our, our festival at, at what was uh, just following a four day strike. Um, and it was that space, it was that space where then you had sort of a, a fringe fundamentalist group trying to take over and trying to take the space on the TV. Um, and, and it's just reiterating the fact that, look, this is like less than 5% or 2% of the population, but the, the vibrancy with all levels of society came and participated and spoke their minds and said all sorts of things which you, you felt at that time that, oh, could Bangladesh take this kind of thing? We're so polarized, but actually um, everybody was so uh, open in what they said, and it was okay. But there was still the fear there that you know maybe somebody will just take a sound bite and put it out in the papers and, and take it out of context. And, and, but the, that the entire 15, 20,000 people who came um, did have that space. I mean, look, you and I have both lived in the West, and now, you know, we, 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 we were, you live in, in Bangladesh, and I live in Sri Lanka, Parthia. So we know, when we undertake the jobs, we do that. We don't have the freedom that I would have in Canada and you would have in, in the UK. Um, and we undertake the, the job under the understanding that we don't have the same kind of freedom. But we undertake it because I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to talk for you, but I take it because I'm going to push as far as I dare, you know? I mean, uh, I don't want to get killed, I don't want to get beaten up, I don't want to get charged under the sodomy law. So, I, you know, you go as far as you can go. And the problem, though, in a country like Sri Lanka is that you don't know what the line is. Um, and so you don't know when you're crossing the line. Oh my God, that's so true. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> and, and, so, and, so, and, and it's very deliberate because, what they, because then what you have to do is you have to self-censor, okay? And so you are trying to now do a battle, not just the, on the social level, but with your, your battle with your artistic soul as well. Because you don't know how far you can go, but you're going to go as far as you dare. And sometimes you, 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 sometimes I feel, okay, I could have gone further. And then I'll, you know, and then sometimes I think, oh, I think I might have gone too far. I don't know, I don't know what that line is. It's very unclear to me. But you and I are undertaking this job in this situation trying to get as far as we can possibly. And I think it's interesting you say that because 
Um, you know, one would have thought that you know you have corporate sponsors, this, that, and you have to think of all of that as well. And you don't want to be straightjacketed by it. And um, you know, in my own personal situation, I'm, I've got so much support from you know our title sponsor and other sponsors that quite often it's they leave it up to me. It's your judgment. But, uh, do you think that you know the literature or art or culture, you know, they they kind of. Um, to make that space for themselves, you know, because as far as media is concerned in Sri Lanka, you know, the, they were completely blacked out from all the war zones, and it was only the social media or people taking too many risks who were reporting some of the stories of, you know, stories came out much later through filmmakers, etc. So, do you think literature has been able to negotiate more space than perhaps journalism journalism could have? Mm, not really. I mean, it, it's sort of like. No, I, I mean, to say that would be uh, really dishonest. I mean, you know, to say that would be to um, um, give literature kind of a uh, place that it shouldn't have. I mean, um, I mean, journalism is really important. I mean, the reporting of, of, of the truth is important, and literature does not substitute for that. I don't think it's a substitution. I, it can't substitute. I think that you you do have to be 